Welcome back, everybody. This week, we're going to have a meaningful conversation. I already know it's going to be meaningful with Ori. Ori, take a second to say hello to the audience. Hi, everyone. Thrilled to be here. Hi, Tony. Absolutely. We're so excited to have you. I've been looking forward to this interview. With that said, let's kick it off with a one word open. If you could use one word right now to describe how you're feeling in this moment so the audience and I could be right there with you, what would that be? Curious. I'm curious to hear what you have to ask. Excellent. Well, let's go right into it. So if you could take the next three to five minutes, tell us about your background, who you are, what you stand for, and tell us about your business and you know who you help, how you help them. That would be wonderful. A lot. So my name is Ori Zeek. I was trained as a physicist. I have a PhD in physics, but I haven't been practicing physics for uh, many years. I've been mostly uh, spending my time as an entrepreneur. On, in the energy sector. About four years ago, I was uh, introduced to the company that I'm the CEO of, a um, company called Qnergy. It's a very unique company because it's, it consists of a group of innovators that decided to solve a problem that was lagging for 200 years. The problem of how to make a practical cost-effective sterling engine. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled about uh, this opportunity. As a physicist, entrepreneur, and a CEO, it brings uh, everything together. Uh, Qnergy is um, using the sterling technology to address one of, what I think is one of humanity's biggest challenges is within climate change, how to mitigate methane emissions. So we are uh, addressing this problem uh, boldly and I'll uh, be probably diving more into how and why and uh, the commercial about it, commercial aspects of it. I would just say that we've been growing 100% year over year in the last three, four years um, and, and it's exciting. That's really great. I can't wait to dive deeper. Let's shift over to some wins. I know you drive a lot of impact. I would love to hear a recent win that you were able to put on the board, so to speak. And tell us when you were going through this and you experienced the win uh, for your company, you know, what did that look like and what was your takeaway from it? So I would say that this win, the, the win that I'll choose is divided to two parts. Part number one is the choice of application that we're still pursuing. And part number two is a lead customer that wanted to go public with the win. We have other customers, but they preferred to uh, be uh, more silent about it. So the choice of application is abating methane emission in, natural, in the natural gas supply chain. So I, it will force me sort of to dive in a little bit into the methane story. So it turns out that methane, a ton of methane is about 84 times 84 times more damaging to the climate than a ton of CO2. So clearly we need to focus on methane. Now the sources of methane are very distributed. It might be remote gas fields, it might be organic waste from restaurants, kitchens, the Walmarts of the world, uh, landfills and so on. So we've chosen to focus on methane abatement because it's a great product market fit to our technology and a huge emerging need. Uh, within this, our first market was uh, oil and gas. The natural gas supply chain has a, lag, a, 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 pain, a pain point, a major pain point. The EPA is trying now actually to regulate this pain point. And the pain point is that they've been using the pressure of the gas that comes out of the ground as a way to control their operation. That's what's called pneumatic devices. Namely, think about a gas operation. You need to control uh, how much uh, gas is flowing to different directions. So you have valves that are operated pneumatically with the pressure. Anytime you, a valve changes a state, natural gas is emitted. The natural gas is mostly made methane. So this, in the US, there are about a million of these devices, a million. The equivalent of you know a few tens of millions car million cars just these you know silly valves. So we've chosen to solve this problem by using the properties of our sterling generator, which I'll touch in a minute. Using the properties of our sterling generator, we decided to address this uh, problem. 
uh, we've developed a product. We started, we launched this product about two and a half years ago. And in a, a few months ago, we've um, um, announced a deal with the Total Energies, one of the largest energy companies in the world that announced publicly that they've bought more than a hundred of our systems. We hope that they'll keep buying more. And there are others that uh, bought also three digit you know, units that allows us to obviously foster our growth to solve this methane problem. So now probably I should describe why us, why can we solve something that nobody else could? And this, and, and, and this, this ties to the two fundamental advantages of the uh, Sterling technology that we have. The first advantage is that it's very reliable. It's so reliable that originally the technology that we use was developed for space application because this is one place when you cannot send service people. And so it was developed by, to, for space applications. In fact, NASA has a, a press release saying that the design received from our engineers is the most reliable heat engine ever invented in the history of humanity. So one advantage is the reliability. The other advantage is that it can work with very dirty, as a figure of speech, fuels, namely take natural gas that comes out of, out of the ground, unrefined, unfiltered, and en our engine runs with it reliably. So here is, a, here is an engine that can run on any fuel reliably in every place on the planet. So we put it in natural gas sites. We use it to run air compressors. So that ties the link to these pneumatic devices. So instead of using the pressure of the gas, they can use the um, uh, air pressure to open and close these valves. This is about a $3 billion market, so we, which, we, which we're already addressing and already a market leader. So a huge, a huge um, a win for us. That's wonderful. Um... I mean, it's that's pretty deep because I know you've had the success that you you sold triple digits to one one vendor and other ones as well. So that's really great that people are pick, picking up on the difference that you guys make. Let's talk about the other side of of the win. So you know you have all these wins. Sometimes failure, you know, sometimes people don't want to talk about failure, but it's there. It's just a part of life. It's a part of business. If you could just spend a couple minutes telling us maybe a recent failure. That you experienced and obviously you got through it what was your takeaway from you know pushing through it so to speak interesting i think uh, one of the uh, lesson learned for us as a company and i don't know if it's i think it's more a temporary failure than a permanent failure but it is a failure which early on we've it was a little bit even ahead. Of, it was ahead of my time, yeah, so I take I cannot take full responsibility for the failure, but I will. The company tried to develop a residential generator. Now, this our generator has these two advantages: it's very reliable, and it's also um, works with any fuel, as I said. But because our quantities, our, our numbers are orders of magnitude less than you know our competitors. If you think about it, humanity is, develop, is building millions, hundreds of millions of internal combustion engines every year. And we're, you know, thousands, let's say. So we try to compete in the residential market. And obviously, we were too expensive. And also, we didn't have the marketing capability. And it, the, 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 we weren't ready. Um, so what we've learned is let's focus on a small uh, in terms of the number of customers, markets, when we can achieve customer intimacy, one of the mantras, one of the lessons learned is we need to keep visiting every customer until we stop learning, which is impossible in the consumer market, in the business, to, in the B2C market, very possible in, uh, in, in oil and gas. You can create the customer intimacy and really understand the problem that you're solving. And this is imperative and this is like the major lesson learned and, and something that uh, we as a company do, I'm as an entrepreneur do, um, trying to really understand the customer application and create this intimate relationship with the customer before you try to scale. 
that's definitely a valuable lesson for all of us. So if someone is B2C versus B2B, they could have a solid takeaway, even if you're not, you know, something similar to what you do, but it's a great takeaway for anyone who's listening. So I do appreciate that. Let's shift over uh, to thought leadership. So I would love to hear from you as a thought leader. I want to hear your point of view on thought leadership. For example, if you could give us the top three things that directly correlates to someone being an awesome thought leader, what would those top three things be from your point of view? That's a great ask. I don't know if I can qualify as a thought leader. Um, Good question. I'm not sure that I have the answer. I would say that uh, to make it interesting, you need to bring something unique, something that people don't you know, already know and, and it's not obvious. And it needs to be diligent and then maybe supported by data. It can be something that, uh, you know, just an idea without any support. Uh, and with that data, and it needs to be um, apl applicable. Namely, there should be something that people can do about it. If it's not unique, not supported by data and not, and not something that people can implement, I don't think that it has a sustainable value. Awesome, thank you very much. How about company culture? I know um, you're a leader at your company, so um, you're in charge. I would love to hear from your perspective, You know, when it comes to company culture, what are the top three attributes that a company must have? Um, or let's just say there's three ingredients that you see when you're looking at any company, you go, wow, they must have a awesome company culture because of one, two, and three that you see on the outside. So what would those three things be? Yeah. So for us, that's, that's, that's for me an easy question because that's, that's my dailies. Uh, the number one is a culture of trust and respect and not command and control. For, for me, at least, a command and control a culture doesn't scale because if you don't trust and respect your people, you, you need to follow up on every little details and that becomes impossible. So trust and respect culture is number one in every business relationship with customers, with suppliers, with investors, and with employees. That's like the fundamental. The second is um, measuring. I mean, it's not, it's not that um, the tail is wagging the dog. It's not that you, know, you need to measure everything for, to exhaustion, but there needs to be some measurables on top of financials that allows you to guide what you want to do. Similar to athletics or any aspect of life, it needs to be grounded in some quantitative reality. The third, and maybe it's the second in terms of priorities, is uh, everything needs to be execution oriented. It's, it's, it does, it's very inefficient to end meetings when you don't have clear, crisp action items. Everything needs to be boiled down to something that someone needs to do about. It's, it's, um, um, the business life is very, needs to be very crisp. Uh, I mean, there are brainstormings, there are meetings that you know, just want to um, uh, kick around ideas, which is fine. But operational meetings needs to end up with concrete, crisp action items. Very important. That's excellent. So I know that you, at your company, you guys make a difference, not only a difference, but you make a positive difference. I would love to hear from you if, you know, I know all the experiences and all the differences that you've made throughout the years. Is there one specific one, one example of all of them that you could share with us that you're most proud of, that you want to share with us that, you know, this was a situation, we came in, and this is how we made the impact. <clears throat> What would that be? So I think I think it ties back to this uh, methane abatement issue that I've described. So I want to I want to shed some light on on the on what's going on in, on methane. So you know climate is warming, global warming is a huge issue, and carbon dioxide is probably the number is is known as the number one problem. Everybody talks about the carbon footprint. If you look at the data, the recent IPCC report, you will see that methane is a close second to carbon dioxide. You would see that one of the measures to reduce carbon dioxide emissions is actually to reduce 
um, coal-fired power plant, but the coal-fired power plant also has particles that has a cooling effect. Leaving methane is very important um, is the, because you know the carbon is limited. On top of that, um, if you look, and I won't get into too much details, but if you, a carbon, um, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is close to some kind of saturation in terms of its climate impact. And methane is very far. The easiest way to think about it is reducing methane emission by 50% is much easier and has larger impact. So all this was to convince you that methane is somewhere that people should focus on. And I'm sure that until recently, until like six months ago, most of the listeners, including yourself, maybe didn't hear, even hear that there is a methane problem. So methane is a big deal. Now let's think about how methane is emitted and how methane is abated. Methane is, abit is emitted in a very distributed way. Every landfill, every piece of garbage, sorry for the figure of speech, rotting um, food, everything emits methane. Um, so the sources are very distributed. On the other hand, the current solutions are centralized. It's large, renewable natural gas plants, large, huge biodigesters. You think about a dairy farm. It's like these huge digesters with power plants. But you have many of the, many, many of the dairy farms in the world actually have less than 100 cows. So you cannot, you, cannot, you cannot apply any methane abatement there. So what we've decided is to focus on this distributed methane problem. Starting with, starting with oil, and oil and gas, but then going to places like biogas in uh, waste streams, in industrial kitchens, in um, um, dairy farms, and so on, and use the properties of the fundamental technology that we have, the Stirling engine, add additional technologies like air compressors, biodigester, etc., to solve this problem. So to dial back to your question, what am I proud of in terms of impact? Let's do the numbers. Uh, climate change is a numbers problem. So if a ton of methane is 84 more potent than a ton of CO2, each, which is the formal uh, international panel of climate, uh, intergovernmental panel of climate change numbers. So it's not numbers that we've invented. These are the formal, so to speak, numbers. So each ton is 84 times more potent than a, a ton of CO2. So now let's compare our generator to an electric car powered by solar energy. So for most people, electric car powered by solar energy is a green solution, right? It, 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 it contributes. Uh, and let's assume for the sake of argument that our generator costs the same and is more or less the same size. So in terms of abatement, we abate more than 100 times so for the same dollar, you have 100 times more abatement of our system than of an electric car powered by solar. That's something that we're very proud of because um, uh, we're a group of you know, engineers from Israel and, and Utah, working in Utah. Um, and, and we're proud of the fact that we're solving a problem that wasn't solved before and addressing climate change in a meaningful, meaningful quantitative manner. That's really great. And I wanted to thank you for what you do. This is incredible to have someone like yourself at your caliber on this show. And you're educating all of us on you know what you do and how you do it. So I really appreciate that. And here we are at the end. Um, our listeners are probably curious. They want to connect with you. So if you want to give out a social handle, whether it's LinkedIn or however you want people to follow you, that would be great. And also give out your website address. That way they can find out more information about your company as well. This would be a great time to do so. Excellent. So the website is uh, qnergy.com, www.qnergy.com. It's like energy with a Q.com. Um, my LinkedIn is uh, Ori Zik, one, uh, my name, Ori Zik, LinkedIn. Um, and, um, you know, happy to connect with people that are uh, passionate about the same uh, topics. Wonderful. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes. And a very final last question, Ori. So, uh, if you could give us a one word close, tell one us word. what that is, and please tell us why you're choosing this word to sign off with. I think that the word will be elevated, 
And the reason is because I feel elevated and the company is growing. So we're in on an elevation path, growing 100% over year over year, hoping to and planning to continue to do so. Ori, this has been outstanding. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to having you on here in the future so we can catch up. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And thanks, everyone.